we've reminded you, uh, you could take the book of Philippians and look at it from so many different angles. Uh, there's so many words you could use to describe it. But I think Dr. Warren Wiersbe did it the very best. He said the book of Philippians is the Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. He talked about the secure mind and so forth and all, all the way through. Really, really good in my opinion. You come to chapter 3 and you see the pressing on of the Christian believer. The pressing on of the Christian believer. I'm sure that uh, you've learned by now that the Christian life is not easy. Amen? If you find it easy, I want to talk to you after church. You must have something I don't have. As a matter of fact, the more you know about the Bible and the more faithful you are, the more battles you'll face. That's just the way it is. Now, the man that wrote the book of Philippians was no stranger to heartache and no stranger to difficulties. And uh, over and over again, he talked about the trouble that we had at Troas and just mentions the things that he went through. Spent the last days of his life in a prison, but yet he kept pressing on. You've heard me say before that uh, it takes about 12 positive strokes to overcome one negative stroke. We, we human beings are men and women of emotions. And the devil knows how powerful emotions are. And if he can get us in a negative frame of mind, and he'll use a myriad of things to discourage you, I know. I've been preaching too long, I know. And um, you discover after you've preached for a while that uh, everybody's not going to like you. You're going to be misquoted, misunderstood, on and on and on. And you'll find out that there'll be some of the people that you thought were the best friends in the world were really against you all along. And you have to put up with that. But what do you do? You keep pressing on. Amen? You keep pressing, pressing, pressing on. Now, uh, in chapter 3, let's begin reading in verse 1 with your Bibles open now. Let me say once again, I hope that you're not in a hurry. Uh, sometimes we get into a hurry. We want to go from this verse to that verse to that verse to this chapter to that chapter to that chapter. Uh, sometimes there's a reason to do that, and uh, probably in a little while once we finish our sermons on heaven uh, and some of our studies in Philippians and 1 John, we'll probably do that for a while. We'll look at a different subject each Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night for a while and then go back later on to expository preaching. But it's very, very important that we see what the Lord has set for us. Now, verse 1. Finally, now... Many Bible scholars believe that Paul had in his mind to close what he wanted to say to the Philippians here. Finally. But then as he began to speak, the Holy Spirit changed his mind and said, this is not all there is that I want you to say. And so he started out saying, finally, my brethren. He might have been saying something like this. This is so important. I want you to listen to this. You need this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul is saying to the Philippians, you need what I'm going to say. You need what I'm going to say. I remember many times, uh, setting in the class at Tennessee Temple, doctrines, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, and the teacher, a man of uh, years, I mean a man of years, taught for years, pastored for years, uh, Dr. Robert Burdett, dean of our Bible school, when I went there, about six foot four, very distinguished southern gentleman type, always wore a double-breasted suit, always had a gold watch uh, in his vest, deep 
powerful voice. And so many, many times he'd say to us, Now men, you need this. You need to get this. I never will forget, and I think I told you about this, uh, but sometimes I feel like that I, I need to repeat myself to, for expression that I want to give to you. Young preacher. And so I had the opportunity to preach a Brush Arbor Revival. How many of you know what a Brush Arbor Revival is? Boy, some of you old folk out there. A Brush Arbor Revival. You know what that is? That's what you, you go back on the mountain and you cut down some poles and you put them up and you cut some limbs down from the trees and you build an auditorium and you put leaves and everything up there to keep the sun off of you and you put some old seats out there and you invite people to come. Well, that's what it was. And I'd never preached a Brush Arbor Revival before and I'm 18 years old. Can you imagine that? But you know something? God really blessed us. We went three weeks. Three weeks with 40 people, 40 decisions. Okay, now I'm Billy Sunday. I am Billy Sunday now. Look at this, Billy Sunday. And you talk, they say that a preacher struts the most right after he's hatched than any other time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I was strutting. So I missed a whole week of school. <clears throat> I go back in Monday morning. And we have evangelism class. That's the first one. And uh, then we have English. Oh, I really look forward to English. And Miss Wolf. Now, you men need this. Oh, yeah, I need this. Yeah, I need this. Get me into a doctrines class. I need it. And, boy, she was precise, you know. And then his class was after chapel. We had chapel. And then we had doctrines class. And I walked in, and some of the guys had already heard about this great meeting that, that we had had. Boy, they were just congratulating me and saying, boy, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I thought, you know, you know something? Dr. Burdett's going to tell everybody what a great evangelist I am. And he didn't say one word. Not one word. Taught the class. And after it was over, he said, uh, Mr. Boofer, I'd like to see you at the, up on the podium, please. Well, here it comes. <laughs> Buddy, he's just going to brag on me. And everybody was filing out, and I walked up there with a smile on my face, and he said, young man, and I thought, what is this? He said, I heard about the meeting. I'm happy, but do you realize what you missed here? Do you realize what I could have taught you here? And buddy, he just let me have it. First of all, I was mad. Who is he? I've just had a successful meeting, and he's talking to me like this. And so I was walking out of there. Oh, I was so mad. And so I went to the next class, and I didn't hear a thing the teacher said because I was so mad. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going I'm to complain. And so, my, as you know, my pastor, Wayne Williams, he was a pastor of my church when I was a kid. He was also a student. He was in seminary. And so I said, I'm going to go talk to Wayne. And I told him what happened. And you know what that bird did? He looked at me and he said, well, Bobby, he's right. And I said, well, you traitor. <laughs> you traitor. But you know what Dr. Burdett was saying? I could have given you something that you could have used the rest of your ministry. Now, he said, there's nothing wrong with preaching. There's nothing wrong with it being out and in, in, in seeing people saved. But if God's called you here, that's your calling at this time. That's your calling. I didn't listen to the good advice that I should have listened to. Sometimes we get ourselves in real trouble because we don't listen. Many people come to church on Sunday morning and God's laid on the pastor's heart something that they need and they don't listen. Then later on down the road, they find themselves in a mess. And they could have already had some instructions before that. And so Paul is concerned about the people he's writing to. And by the way, if a pastor is a man of God, he's concerned about his people. He loves his people. He's not here to put on a show. He's not here to 
uh, get rich. He's not here for any of that. He's here to obey the Lord and to preach what God wants him to preach. And that's what I've tried to do down through these years. Regardless of how it's received, if I know God laid it on my heart, I'm going to preach it and leave the rest with the Lord. So Paul says that these people need what he's going to say. And he says, uh, Brethren, I rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And what he's basically saying is this, I have some warnings for you. I thought I was going to stop here, but I'm not. I'm going to go on and give you some very serious warnings that will help you for the rest of your days. And so what does he say? Look at verse 2 and verse 3. Beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Now the word concision there refers to the legalist that split people apart, that separated people. Beware of those kind of people. Listen, beware of people that divide. Godly Christians don't divide. You understand? Godly Christians don't divide. Godly Christians work for unity. This church will never do anything great for God unless we're at oneness. Unity. Now, all of us have different ideas about this and that and the other thing. That's okay. We're individuals. We have different settings and mindsets and so forth, except when it comes to the truth. And when it comes to the truth, better have the same mindset. Amen? Better have the same mindset. And so Paul says, uh, beware of dogs. Be very aware of dogs. Now, the word for dogs here is not a little pet. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking a little, about a little pet. He's talking about a vicious dog. They had, had them in, in Jerusalem. You've got them in cities now, these, and you've got them in places now. These packs of dogs that run together and they destroy. You have to, they're very dangerous. And he says, beware of dogs. Beware of these types of people. And he was talking about the Judaizers. The Judaizers. Who were the Judaizers? They claimed to be the elite. They were the elite. They knew more than anybody. They were of the concision. They were of the circumcision. They were the elite leaders in Jerusalem. But they were separating the people of God. And so he said, beware of them. Keep your eyes open. And then he says, beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Those that divide. By the way, Go back to Isaiah, will you please? Back to the book of Isaiah chapter 56. Let me give you three verses here that will maybe give us a little bit more enlightenment as to what he's saying here. This is back in the Old Testament, and it'll give us a little bit. And by the way, <clears throat> learn to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, the Bible's one book. 66 books, but yet it is one book, and it doesn't contradict itself. doesn't contradict itself. You have to have an understanding of the Old Testament to understand the New, and vice versa. You know, we don't hear a lot of preaching out of the Old Testament anymore, do we? As a matter of fact, some preachers, have, you know what they've done? Even some Baptist preachers, they don't preach anything in the Old Testament, and they don't preach anything in the Gospels. They just preach the epistles. You're leaving out much of what God has said, okay? And so you can learn much by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay, he's talking about these vicious dogs. And now let's back in, look back in the Old Testament. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. This is really an Old Testament account 
really of what Paul is talking about over in the book of Philippians. And so here in Isaiah 56, verse 10, watch it again, his watchman. Oh, we'll back up into in, in verse um, 8. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcast of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. All you beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all the beasts of the forest. Now get the idea here. In the Old Testament, just as in the New Testament, there are vicious animals and vicious dogs spiritually that are out to destroy. Out to destroy. Once again, be careful what you hear on television, radio. Be careful who you listen to. Rightly divide the word of truth and be very, very careful because there's dogs out there, there's vicious animals out there that will destroy your love for the Lord, that will destroy and will split a, a church asunder if we allow them to get into our hearts and into our minds. But let's read on in verse 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs, as such as can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. Did you see that? They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain from his quarter. I'll read verse 12 in just a moment. You know, a shepherd is to do what? care for the sheep. He's even to go so far as to risk his life for the sheep. That's his job. He carries a, 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 a staff in his hand and it has a crook on it. That staff is for several different things. First of all, it's used in a loving way. The shepherd would walk along with that staff and the sheep that were there, he would pet them and he'd take his staff and he would play with them and touch them, and have fun with them, and it showed his love for them. It was also used to rescue the sheep. A sheep might be in, in, in danger, had gotten over a, a cliff and was ready to fall off, and he could take his staff and that crook on it, and he would reach down, and he would put it around the, the sheep's neck, and he would pick it up, and he, would, and he would bring it back. Or he would use that staff as a weapon to fight off wolves and, da and dangerous animals. If you know anything about sheep, they're dumb animals. I told you a few weeks ago about the Old Testament sacrifices and offerings, the brazen altar at the tabernacle. And the priest would be there and this brazen altar is burning with fire. And the people would bring their sheep to sacrifice for their sins. And the priest would walk over to that little sheep and he's got a knife in his hand and he's going to slit the throat of that sheep. He's going to kill it. And that little sheep would lick its fingers, lick, lick his hands. Little pet lambs. That's how docile they are. And how ignorant they are. And I hate to say it, that's the only way I know how to say it. But let me say this. Without the leadership of the word and the leadership of solid preaching and teaching, church members will think that these dogs, these leaders, are true when they're not. See, a lot of people in the Old Testament, as in the New Testament, thought these shepherds were leading them to the promised land when they were leading them to their death. I read the story one time about a man that looked like a shepherd and he was herding sheep. Herding sheep. He had a staff like the shepherd and he was herding sheep trying to get them to go. And a man walked up to him and said, uh, I don't, didn't think shepherds treated their sheep like this. He put his staff in the ground looked at him and said, I'm not the shepherd. I'm taking them. I'm, I want to slaughter them. I'm not the shepherd. I'm going to kill them. On Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, all through the week, there are false shepherds on television that have 
millions and millions and millions of dollars flying airplanes, living in multi-million dollar homes. Their big old church or auditorium is packed with people and they're sitting there just so wonderful. It's so wonderful. And they're being led to slaughter. They're being led to slaughter. I'm simply asking you as Journey Baptist Church to be awake and be alert because there's false shepherds out there. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. And then verse 12, Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. So there's an Old Testament passage that gives you a little bit of an idea of what Paul is saying here in the New Testament about being alert. And he's telling these folk, he says, I want you to press on. You're a believer. I want you to press on. And he's going to tell them how they can press on. And the very first thought is this. Watch out for false teachers. Now verse 2 uh, of, this, of this chapter. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are of the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Very important. If you think you can live the Christian life in the flesh, you are wrong, my friend. You are wrong. The only way you can live in the, the Christian life and be victorious is to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Dr. Lee Robertson was walking out of a meeting one night. He had just preached. And he had preached on the filling of the Holy Spirit. And he was walking out, going to his car. And this young college student walked up to him and said, Dr. Robertson, can I talk to you? And he said, certainly. And he looked at Dr. Robertson and he said, Brother Robertson, he said, I'm not trying to be a smarty. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that at all. But could I ask you a question? He said, well, certainly. He said, Dr. Robertson, are you filled with the Holy Spirit right now? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit right now? And Dr. Robertson said, I'm not going to tell you what I told him. But he said, I walked away thinking about that. And he said, that stayed in my mind. And I wanted it to stay in my mind. Dr. Robertson, are you filled with the Holy Spirit right now? If you ask me that right now, what would I say? If I ask you that tonight, if we were one-on-one, -on -one, and I looked you in the eye and I said, are you filled with the Holy Spirit right now? What would you say? Now, it takes the Holy Spirit to minister. Am I right? Singing, preaching, teaching, witnessing. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. If you're going to stand behind a podium like this and open your Bible and preach, you better be filled with the Spirit. Because people need what you're going to say. But you need to be filled with the Spirit so that you can deliver what God wants you to say. I don't want to deliver anything unless God's leading me to say it. And in your Sunday school class, if you're a teacher, same thing. And whatever you do, if you're up here singing, be filled with the Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. And if you'll do that, God will use you and use you in a mighty, wonderful, wonderful way. And you never know what God can do if you'll faithfully preach and teach the Word. So our time's running out and we're not going to get very far tonight, but that's okay. Read on with me now, if, if you will. Verse 2 again. Fulfill you... I'm in chapter 2. I better get back to chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Those that cause divisions. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Do you hate it when you get in the flesh? Do you? Boy, I do. I do. 
You know, some mornings you get up and you're just ready to go. You're ready to go. You know, you've been with the Lord. You prayed before you went to sleep that night. You woke up in the middle of the night. You prayed again. Woke up that morning. You had your prayer time with the Lord. And just, you're, you're just so happy. You get in your car and you head out to work and maybe in the car or at work, something happens and it doesn't take much, does it? Just all of a sudden, that's it. That's an awful feeling, isn't it? Now think about this. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're just in sweet communion with the Lord. It's just sweet communion. By the way, you don't have to be in church to have great communion with the Lord. You can do it by yourself. Amen. You can do it by yourself. I would advise that we do it. Amen? And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden something happens and that sweet spirit is broken. You better do something about it quickly. You better do something about it quick. Don't let it continue to fester and get worse and worse and worse. Do you like it in your home when there's division and agitation? Do you like that? I don't think we do, do we? We don't like that. Remember the old song we used to sing, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the presence of the Lord. We need that in our home. We need it in our church. And I hope that when people come in here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they sense that there's a sweet spirit in this place. We're not perfect. We're just sinners saved by grace. I can overlook your battles, and you can overlook mine. We can help one another and love one another. Isn't it a great thing that when you're struggling, you can get Christians to pray for you? and so forth and so on. What a wonderful thing. By the way, I just heard on the news tonight, I, was, uh, I got in the office early, and uh, I'd always turn on uh, North Valley Baptist Church out in uh, Santa Clara, California, and just leave the music on while I'm studying, and they come on with the news. They are now propagating to not allow ministers, pastors, to give any kind of teaching, any kind of giving solutions to people because you don't have the right to do that. You're invading their privacy. It's what they said. And they're trying to get a law passed where pastors can't counsel people. Isn't that something? Just this afternoon. Folk, we're getting close. We're in the last days. I think we're getting close to the rapture. You know, it may be one of these days that preachers can't do anything except in their church, and then they'll take that away. We better use the freedom we have right now. Right now. All right, let's, let's just few, read a few more verses, and then we'll close in just a moment. Down in verse <clears throat> uh, 3 again. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and receive Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he hath whereof that he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which of the law, blameless. Now look at this. But what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, refuge, that I may win Christ. I wonder how many of us have ever gotten to that place in their Christian life. I wonder how many Christians ever get to that place. Isn't that an amazing statement? I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, refuge, that I may win Christ 
And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'm going to go down to verse 14 and we'll stop. Now look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I hear these guys on television saying God wants you to have money. He wants you to be rich. He wants you to drive a Mercedes. He wants you to have all of this. And I ask the question, is that like Jesus? Now there's nothing wrong with having that if God gives it to you. Understand? If God gives it to you, there's nothing wrong with that. But some of the greatest saints had nothing. Some of the greatest preachers and missionaries had nothing. We're, we're, we're supporting missionaries right now. Ask this young man here about the mission field. Ask him. He'll tell you. And his dad and mom have been there a long time. We've supported them a, a long time. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and have the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may have apprehended that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press. The word press, there's pressure. I put pressure into this. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'll close by asking you and me this. What are your goals for your Christian life? What are your goals? Short-range goals, long-term goals. Do you have them? Have you sat down and said, Lord, help me to put together some short-range goals that I can attain and then when I reach them, I'll go again. And then have long range goals. I love the story about the little boy with the BB gun shooting at the moon. And the man said, what are you doing, son? He said, I'm shooting at the moon. And he said, don't you know you'll never hit the moon with a BB? He said, no, but I'm getting closer than you are. I like that. I'm getting closer than you are. Well, how close are we to the Lord? Like Paul was asking that he wanted to be. I remind you again that one day we'll be on that shore forever. Forever. But you know what? What have we sent over that will be waiting for us when we get there?